in a balcony. Well, today we are joined by our NAMS board member, Ryan Godfrey, to share his experiences and knowledge in this space. We will enjoy Ryan's presentation um, and balcony garden tour, and then do a Q&A in the end. Now, for those of you who don't know Ryan, Ryan is a botanist um, with a Bachelor of Science in Ecology and Environmental Biology from the University of Toronto, from the University of British Columbia, sorry, and the Master's in Science in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from the University of Toronto. Ryan has spent a decade studying native plants in academia, museum collections, botanical gardens, as an environmental consultant and working on community engagement programs in the non-for-profit sector. His current focus is on the role that individuals and neighborhoods can play in restoring habitat and ecological function in human dominated landscapes. Ryan is a NAMS board member, like I said, um, and currently working with WWF Canada's In The Zone program as their resident botanist. We're fortunate to have you with us today, Ryan. Now over to you. Thanks very much, Athena. That's great. Okay, and I'm so glad to see all 49 of you here live and anyone who's watching the recording too. Thanks for coming by. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say a little bit about NAMPS starting off. I've been a NAMPS member for five or six years now. Um, it's a wonderful organization. I, I really love um, all the time that I spend with my fellow NAMPS people. Um, here listed are some of the great uh, benefits of becoming a NAMPS member. I highly encourage everyone watching, if you're not already a member, to become a member today. And if you're already a member, then thank you very much. That's, we really appreciate it. Um, and I also just wanted to remind people of our conservation properties. Not everybody knows um, that we have two really wonderful pieces of land that we steward, um, one in um, Norfolk County, that's uh, Shining Tree Woods, and one up on the Bruce Peninsula, that's Zinken Island Cove. Um, and I've been to Shining Tree Woods, it's beautiful, and I've been very close to Zinken Island Cove. I never quite made it onto the property, but I was right next to it, and I, I'm sure it's beautiful. I know it's beautiful. <laughs> so that's just something interesting to know about the organization. Next slide, please, Athena. I, I wanted to uh, also let people know about Project Swallowtail, which is a collaboration between many organizations, but including NAMPS and um, WWF and In The Zone, my employer. And if you happen to be in this area of West Toronto between High Park and Bathurst and from DuPont down to uh, the Lakeshore, we're, we're pioneering um, an example of how neighborhoods and communities can restore habitat in a city um, by connecting people all up. And it's kind of neat. It's what I'm, I'm working on a lot during, uh, during my days. And if you want to learn more about this, you can visit projectswallowtail.ca or alternatively, another website is inthezonegardens.ca slash projectswallowtail. Both are available. Basically, the goal is we want to get these beautiful swallowtail butterflies back to our landscape by planting their host plants. Next slide, please. Okay. Wanted to remind folks about the plant sales. Obviously this year is a little bit different from usual um, because of uh, social distancing and all of that. But actually I got started at NAMPS by um, attending one of the plant sales in Christie Pitts all those six years ago. They're really beautiful um, things and special and there's really nothing quite like them. So I can't wait for us to start those up again. Um, and you can learn more on our website. You can learn more about local native plant nurseries near you. Um, and, uh, and there's also this really cool partnership between uh, Loblaws and Carolinian Canada that's worth noting where it's now possible to get locally sourced native plants in certain Loblaws centers, which is pretty new and exciting, if you ask me. So visit inthezonegardens.ca. There's a, a link up at the top there that says uh, where to find native plants, and, um, and that'll lead you to some more information about that. All right, next slide, please. Okay, getting into this presentation. So we're going to start off by talking a little bit of context, why we're concerned with native plants, why it's worth talking about them in the first place, and then I'll get into a little bit about container gardening itself, um, some background, 
And then I'll share with you some of the things that I've learned over the past five or six years of gardening on my balcony about assessing conditions, the right kind of materials to use, tools, soils, etc., the right kind of plants. And then I'll give you my thoughts on maintenance and design. Remember, I am not a designer, I'm not an architect, I'm a botanist. So um, my idea of beauty is, is all about a natural and a wild aesthetic, but, um, but I still have some, some things I'd like to share. So we'll do that afterwards. And then we'll go out on the balcony and check out my garden. Okay, next slide, please. So I, I always like to start off with some definitions. So to me, a garden is any place where plants grow and people take care of them. So it's a pretty broad definition. It covers a lot of different spaces. Next, um, ecology. That's the study of the relationships between living organisms and their non-living environment. Okay. Ecological restoration is when we use ecology to assist in the recovery of degraded or destroyed ecosystems for the benefit of both nature and humans together. Stewardship is the responsible use and protection of the natural environment through conservation and sustainable practices. So NAMS practices stewardship on our, our properties, for example. Um, native plants, lots of different definitions. The one that I'm using today is the regional flora that have evolved in your local place for thousands of years and they're adapted to local conditions and co-evolved with local organisms like pollinators and wildlife. There's really no substitute for that. You, you can't just swap in any other species. It will not have those relationships. So they're really special in that way. Next, we have habitat. That's any area that contains the features essential for the the life cycle needs of an organism. So when you consider, for example, pollinators, that's not just a food source, but habitat also involves a place for them to overwinter, a place for them to mate and lay eggs um, for their caterpillars and their larvae to feed. So it's a, it's a complex area with lots of different features. Next, we have a botanist. That's an expert or a student in the study of plants. And that's me, your, your plant nerd for the next little while. I'm your personal botanist. And then finally, I included horticulture here, which is the art or practice of garden cultivation and management. And I wanted to make the distinction that botanists, you'd think that a botanist and a horticulturist maybe are the same thing, but they're actually quite different fields of study. And I know a lot of botanists who have a lot to learn about horticulture and vice versa too. My strength is definitely in botany and I've just been learning about horticulture um, myself um, as a hobby. So next slide, please. I wanted to include this slide because I think it's a really great quote from Emma Gilchrist in the Narwhal. She wrote this um, back at the beginning of the pandemic and noted that community scale solutions are going to become ever more necessary as the pandemic spreads. So gardens, families, neighbors, friends, all of this is an important way for us to deal with the situation that we've got going on. And I really agree with Emma in this case. And I also agree that it's a, an important moment to take stock of where we're at and maybe reevaluate whether um, what our priorities are and adjust as we move forward. Next slide, please. So ecology, let's back right up. What is, what is all of this about? Okay, so ecology, I said it's that science, the relationships between living organisms and their non-living environment, okay? It's a very complex science, actually. Everything in ecology is a cycle and a web that's all layered all at the same time. And it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around all of that. But what's important, um, I think, for all of us to remember is... Um, the principle of ecological restoration. And that is that, that it's restoring degraded and destroyed ecosystems. And the way that you do that, um, there are many techniques involved, but I'm gonna condense it all down for you, okay? Everything down into just two words, ready? So ecological restoration, it's, you just have to know it's native plants. There you go, that's it. Just put the native plants in the ground, everything gets better, okay? And that's what we're doing here at NAMPS. So, 
So when we are doing this, we're building functional ecosystems. Whoa, big word. And what does that mean? And why do we care? And what is it going to look like when we get there? There's, there's three components to that in my view. The first one is biodiversity. So that's species. It's all of those organisms that rely on the functioning ecosystem. That includes plants, of course, but also pollinators and reptiles and amphibians and birds and all of that. Um, so when, when we're building functioning ecosystems, we're, we're holding up all of biodiversity. We also get out of functioning ecosystems, something called ecosystem services. And these are the things um, that have a dollar value associated with them. So functioning ecosystems, for example, they provide us food, they provide us medicines, they filter our air and our water, they provide shade maybe, so we don't have to, um, crank the air conditioning quite as much. They might um, give us privacy. They might give us peace of mind. They get, might just give us a sense of happiness and well-being. And all of those things have an actual dollar value associated with them. So it's one of the reasons why it's really important to build these functioning ecosystems. Finally, the last part that's really important is connectivity. So in ecology, we talk about connectivity of patches, how you know one patch and another patch and another patch need to be connected to each other through corridors or something in order for wildlife to kind of use that whole system. But what's kind of neat about um, connectivity in the context of gardening is that I think gardening is a way to connect people together. So it connects communities, it connects neighbors, it connects all sorts of different people um, throughout our society through our shared interests in nature which I think is a pretty cool thing. So I like to ask myself this question whenever I'm looking at a green space, and that is, what is your green space doing? So what is it upholding in terms of biodiversity? How many species live there? What are you getting out of this in terms of ecosystem services? And who's connected to your green space? Um, are you connected to local natural areas? Are you connected through your neighborhood? It's just really important things to keep in mind whenever you're looking at a garden, a balcony um, or, or any green space. Next slide, please. So when we're thinking about this, we can realize that there's lots and lots of different stuff that our green space can be doing. We can create habitat for wildlife. We can sequester carbon from the atmosphere and then lots and lots and lots of other things all at the same time. And together, our gardens can help save the world if we do it right. And it's really not that difficult. So, and yes, this is even true in container gardens. So I want to back up, back way up. And here in the top right here, I have a, an illustration of the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And really, when you think about it, the it's, it's a bunch of container gardens. It's a way that these ancient people brought green into their built environment. And so we've been doing this for a really, really long time in a lot of different ways. Below that picture, there's a picture of um, my succulent garden that I have. It's actually just right behind me over here where I've built a little slice of a desert um, so that I can grow these wonderful desert plants in my home. Bonsai in the middle here is another great example of container gardening where we can bring trees inside and prune them in this very beautiful aesthetic kind of way that um, is sort of a meditation and a sculpture all in one. And then I also have this picture on the right of um, a town uh, called St. Leonard's by the Sea in England that I visited last year. And there isn't really any soil in St. Leonard's by the Sea. It's right on the shoreline. But um, what you can see is they have vines and containers everywhere where they, they've decided that, that despite having no soil, they wanted to have gardens. And so to me, container gardening, we do it because we need plants. <laughs> and sometimes that's the only way that we can get them is by growing them in containers. And it works. It actually, it actually works really well. And I'm going to tell you how in just a moment. So let's go to the next slide. Um, one of the really important things to think about is your conditions. So you need to consider the amount of light that you're getting, the amount of water that you're getting, what kind of soil to use. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we go outside. Wind is an important factor that I've learned how to deal with on my balcony. And also what kind of fauna? So what sort of organisms are you gonna get squirrels up? I've heard people as high as the 16th floor getting squirrels 
uh, visiting them, which is <laughs> pretty interesting. Um, so consider all of these features. And in particular, I think it's really instructive and really, if you have a balcony and you just want to get started understanding this, maybe the first thing that you should do, maybe even today, right after this, is to draw a light map. And that's what I've done here in my notebook. This is a picture from my notebook. And what I did, I have a west facing balcony. So I start getting light in the afternoon. And I did this in early spring, but you can do it any time of year. And actually, it's a good thing to do a couple of times a year. And what I did was um, every two hours, I drew in um, the the sunny area of my balcony. Okay, so the first, at first it was just up at the top and then two hours later I came back and there was a little bit more. Two hours later I came back and the entire thing was sunny. Two hours later, again, again, again. So you just keep drawing in and you can see the areas that are more shaded get more light actually. So that area near the edge of my balcony gets actually considerably more light, more like six hours of light, whereas there's that little corner in the lower left that actually gets um, two or fewer hours of light. So it's an important thing to know when you're picking plants um, just how much light you're going to get and where you're going to put them. So everybody should try doing that. And by the way, this trick works for any kind of garden, not just a balcony garden. So do, um, do give that a try. And then underneath that, I just wanted to show you that uh, I tried putting some shade cloth. It was just landscaping fabric that I wove between my, my uh, railings. And I was able to show with this, this light diagram um, how the shade cloth would affect whether I put it on the south side or the north side. So just some cool sort of fun things you can do um, on a rainy day. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Tools, so important. Okay, so first I'll go through what I have on the table here. My hose and bucket. I actually just use this to water outside. I think it's a good idea to watering your containers is important. Um, you're, there's really no way around it. Um, you are going to have to be watering. And if you have a watering can and you don't mind going back and forth from the sink, that's fine. But I, I'm just going to tell you, it saves you a lot of time and effort if you get one of these um, hoses and an attachment that can go onto your sink. If it's possible to do it. Trust me, it's a good idea. <laughs> um, these little tools I have up in the top, I know they look like they would be children's sandbox toys, but they actually work. They work in my containers. I got to tell you, I use them all the time. Um, and then the gardening knife and secateurs are really just necessary tools for everybody to use all the time. Um, I'll tell you about the containers that I use when I go outside. Um, my hose. Twine is also always really good if you're if you've got viney things you want to make um, uh, a trellis. Bamboo rods I use to stake things and and also for making trellises. Um, a, sh a tarp is a good idea for the winter. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And then yeah, mulch and leaves. I do actually go in the fall to the side of the road and pick up people's yard waste bags where they're, you know, shipping their leaves off. And I'm like, no, I want those leaves. And I bring them up in the elevator and I bring them out to my balcony and I use them to bed my garden down, actually to put a little bit of um, an insulative layer to protect my plants over the winter. So just some important tools to use. Um, next slide, please, Athena. Okay, the plants. This is the real learning that I've, I've come to over the past five years. Because at the beginning, I tried to grow everything. I tried growing woodland plants and prairie plants and just any kind of cool native plant. I thought it would be a fun thing to try growing on my balcony. And it didn't always work. <laughs> so over the years, I've learned certain plants work really well and certain plants don't work so well. And there's a pattern in there that I figured out, which is the plants that work, not surprisingly, are those that grow in shallow soil ecosystems in the wild, which makes a lot of sense because I have shallow soil on my balcony. <laughs> um, so really, um, I came to this idea um, about reference ecosystems, which means I'm, I'm taking little snapshots, little inspirational moments from the wild and bringing them into my balcony. And some of these can include a shoreline, which is a pretty rocky spot with maybe just a little bit of um, soil in the cracks of the rocks. It's a pretty windy environment, um, a pretty harsh environment. And you can see there's this lovely um, Zygodinus um, camas lily here that's growing perfectly 
happy in, in these harsh conditions. Another ecosystem that works really well as a reference are alvars. So if you've ever been up to the Bruce Peninsula or um, out to the Camden Plains, you will see these ecosystems with very shallow soil, lots and lots of rocks. Um, and sometimes they just look like a big slab of rock actually. Um, but there's lots and lots of plants that grow there. For example, prairie smoke, wild columbine, um, tons and tons of very, very cool plants live on alvars. And those are great candidates for balcony gardens too. These are sunnier ecosystems. So better if you have six or more hours of light on your balcony, but there are also options for shade. So next slide, please. Um, which include, for example, shallow forests. Again, up um, on the Bruce Peninsula, there are these huge, amazing, sugar maple beech forests that are living in like this much soil. It's crazy. There's boulders everywhere and I don't know how they do it, but they do it. And there's lots of cool species that live in here like um, wild leeks and various wild geraniums. Again, I've seen wild columbine in here, um, starry false Solomon seal. There's various violets that grow here. It's, a, it's a, actually a very cool ecosystem. So um, another one to take inspiration from. And then another idea is what about the plants that live on cliffs or in um, sharp river valleys going down to something like this is 16 mile creek in Oakville. And it's a harsh environment there and you're only getting maximum six hours or so of light per day because it's a, you know, a sideways facing cliff. But again, lots of cool plants, including like witch hazels um, and uh, various others that will live in an ecosystem like this. So these are the types of places where you can visit, take pictures, learn the plants that grow there, and then maybe you'll be inspired to try those plants on your balcony. So next slide, please. Okay, an important point. Um, it's very important to note, let's just go through these one at a time here. Um, what makes a real legitimate native plant for an ecological restoration purpose? And um, you know, you can go to the garden center and see plants that are labeled native plant or Ontario native, but it doesn't always mean that they're the highest quality. So I wanna go through these, these points. So first of all, evidently the species must be native to Ontario, but maybe you even want it to be native to your specific area because you know, Windsor is different from Ottawa, but both of them are in Ontario. So you, you would like to know where even within the province is the species native. Um, it's important also that the source be local because a species like, I'm going to go back to wild columbine again, that's a species that grows all over North America, all the way down to Florida, but I wouldn't want to grow a Florida sourced wild columbine on my balcony because it's not adapted to these local conditions. It doesn't know how to deal with a Canadian winter. So I want plants that are sourced locally and also that are genetically diverse. So um, not just a clonally plop propagated thing because genetic diversity is really important to natural selection, to adaptability, um, and also to serve lots of different organisms, okay? We're also not looking for domesticated plants like cultivars or nativars, which in some cases may actually provide worse um, value to wildlife. So for example, um, a rose that has many, 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 many petals, um, which is a, a type of cultivar, actually doesn't have as much pollen or nectar, so it's less valuable to a bee. We'll check out the next one. There's six points here total. Of course, pesticides, okay? If we want to help the pollinators, it would not do us any good to buy a plant that's been sprayed with pesticides. I think that goes without saying. And the last point is that it's really important that these plants are collected ethically. So we don't want to harm the wild populations of these native plants. We want to um, purchase plants that have been sourced ethically and then propagated um, in a nursery. But those, it, it matters which nurseries, okay? And this is a point that where NAMPS has actually spent a lot of time thinking about this forced relationships with um, local specialized native plant growers. And so if you go to any of our sales, uh, you will know that the plants that you're purchasing meet all of these criteria, okay? So, so you don't have to worry about it. But if you're going someplace like um, a, a typical garden center, these are the types of questions that you wanna ask yourself before you purchase that plant, all right? Just keep that in mind.
Next slide, please. Okay, R to round things out, I wanna talk about some of the things that I've learned about design. Um, so the first one is about plant height. So I, I remember reading this thing about spillers, fillers, and thrillers, okay? So it's a great terminology. It, you know, it'll really stick in your head. So spillers being those plants that kind of spill out of the container, like vines, for example. So I'm growing um, uh, Dutchman's pipe is a vine. I have some strawberry plants that like to sort of spill out. Virginia creeper might be one. Wild clematis might be one that you could try for, um, for spillers. Fillers and thrillers. Okay, I actually, tur turned out I didn't love that terminology because I don't think there are any plants that are just fillers. They're they're all lovely plants. They're all thrilling to me. So um, I switched my, my thinking from, from fillers and thrillers to just shorter plants and taller plants. I think it's nice to have a variety so that you've got lots of different stuff to look at. The next aspect um, is bloom time. So in our flora here in Southern Ontario, most plants bloom um, in the, in the midsummer. Okay, so um, I gave examples of swamp milkweed and wild columbine, but really there's lots and lots and lots of different plants that bloom in the summer. So <clears throat> I like to encourage people to think about species that bloom in the early spring and species that bloom in the late fall to sort of extend your bloom time. So for me, that's strawberries, violets, prairie smoke for early spring and asters and goldenrods for the late fall. And that way you'll have, you know, in Canada up here, we don't have the longest growing period. So you want to, you want to use as much of it as you possibly can. Um, the next thing that I like to look at is leaf shape and texture. So again, just varying things, right? So you want to think about, um, are you going to go for broad leaves versus narrow leaves or sort of feathery leaves? Do you like hairy, um, fuzzy kind of leaves or, or what? There's lots of different options and I like to sort of mix it up. And going back to the conditions that I was talking about before, um, wind is something to consider. So um, on my balcony, for example, I get a lot of wind because I'm west facing. And I find that fine and dissected sort of feathery leaves work better and tough waxy or hairy leaves work better compared to broad and thin leaves, okay? So just consider that kind of thing. Aroma, so important to me. I love touching and smelling plants. I do it all the time. So I like to grow plants that are, are kind of, that bring that aroma factor. So, you know, you've got things like Virginia Mountain Mint, um, the hyssops, plants in the hyssop group. Um, sweet grass is another lovely one that they all have great aromas. So just don't forget about your nose, people. It's not all about the eyes. So you got other senses too that you want to uh, pay attention to. And then lastly, um, right, greens. So native plants um, do bloom and you will get beautiful flowers, but I think it's really important to think about those, uh, those green plants too. And so consider the difference between beautiful plants, pretty plants and handsome plants. So I really like, I think grasses, sedges and ferns are examples of handsome plants and you should have those on your balcony too. It'll bring you a lot of pleasure throughout the year. So with that, I think, oh, this finally, I just wanted to mention my balcony garden ended up sort of spilling out uh, onto the condo property. So I got onto the landscaping committee and I convinced them, it took me about three or four years, but I convinced them to grow a meadow garden and a woodland garden um, in the condo grounds. And so we now have hundreds of native plants planted throughout the area. And since we've done that, we've seen a huge increase in the amount of pollinators and butterflies. We got monarchs for the first time last year. It was really, really an amazing thing. So if you wanna, you know, stretch a little bit further than your balcony, um, this is an option that you might want to take. Just realize it takes a minute. Okay, we have some references for you, some wonderful books. Um, and you can review these books um, when you watch the recording afterwards. We'll send the link to the recording out to everybody. So you don't need to scramble to look at all of these, but it's just, it's a great um, sampling of all of the different perspectives in native plant gardening and ecology. And then we also have some websites. So similarly, don't worry about scrambling to write all this down. You'll be able to check this out in the recording, but um, 
these are some wonderful resources that, that we often visit. And with that, I'd like to, to go outside. Um, and just a reminder, you can follow uh, NAMPS on social media and you can follow me too if you wanna know more about my garden and my plant adventures. Okay, so I'm gonna turn off my video and my audio and I'll meet you back out on the balcony very soon. Okay, Perfect. see you in a moment. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so yeah, so um, so you see our um, our Instagram, Nam's Instagram, uh, and also Ryan's amazing Instagram. Highly recommended. I follow him and learn a lot from him each and every day. Um, so now, so I'll just stop sharing the presentation because Ryan is gonna show us um, his balcony pretty soon in a minute or two. Um, but um, if you are not on the speaker view, I highly recommend that in your Zoom um, window, just click on that speaker view. So when Ryan comes in, um, you can simply um, visit, virtually visit um, his balcony. And also we will have a small Q&A towards the end. So you can use the chat function um, here in your Zoom window just to type in any questions that you have from Brian. We might not be able to get through all the questions, but we will read all of them and do an um, FAQ following the webinar in the upcoming weeks. Um, so please, if you have anything, um, ask away. Um, if you can, um, when, you, when you're typing in your questions, if you can just send send chat to everyone so that everyone is aware of the questions that's being asked asked that would be great i think ryan should be back very shortly and then always if you go um, to namp's website you can find um, the different social media accounts that NAMS has, and, um, including the Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, how to become a member, how to renew membership and all that. So all those information will be there. Um, and same as the recording of this webinar, we'll put it on NAMS YouTube channel. So you can go through it and, and share it away with um, people who might be interested as well. Okay, I think Ryan is back. There we go. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Okay, I have my camera set up here and this thing is just so if it's windy, so you can still hear me. So hopefully you're not hearing too much wind, but I will flip my camera around now. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so there I am. So you're seeing what I'm seeing now. Um, and here is the balcony. Okay, wonderful. So <clears throat> start over here. You can see I've got these containers um, and I like large containers. Okay, that's something that I didn't talk about previously, but I find that bigger containers, first of all, you can just fit more plants in there, which is great, but also they tend to um, be better for getting your plants to persist over winter. Okay, and that's a really important learning, you know, over the years, I, um, I really wanted my plants to grow and come back every year. So I tried everything that I could. And what I learned is smaller containers like this guy over here or these guys over here. Um, I just was finding that a lot of plants were dying over the winter, which was kind of sad. So I switched to bigger containers like these ones. And um, they're about 35 to 40 centimeters in diameter and about the same dimension in depth. And that really worked out well for me. I'm also using these fabric containers. The brand of these is called Root Pouch. They're not paying me to say that, but I really love them. I have to say, they're, they work out very well. <laughs> so I do recommend that. Um, and in terms of soil, so you can actually see what I use for soil right in this one because I haven't planted it yet. It's just regular potting soil, um, you know, peat, perlite, the usual stuff you find at the garden center. Um, but then what I mix in with it is a little bit of solid fertilizer. So something like worm castings or um, 
composted manure, black earth, something like that. And I, I take about three sort of big handfuls, mix it into the top layer of soil when I'm planting things out. And that's because your plants are going to need nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those nutrients that even if it says so on the bag, uh, you know, it is a good idea to add some in the form of that fo solid fertilizer. So yeah, as you can see, um, these are my little containers and I have a whole bunch of them and each of them has kind of a different theme. So this one here in the shady side of my balcony and I am getting light right now, but only for just a couple of hours so they get direct light. This is my woodland garden. And again, these are plants that grow in shallow woodlands. So I, I did try plants like wild ginger, trilliums, hepatica, and they just, uh, they were not doing such a good, I was not able to keep them alive, unfortunately. Um, and I think the reason for that is they need a complex soil that you can really only get by growing with a bunch of trees and, you know, in the ground properly. But these plants, including, um, zigzag goldenrod, I've got a woodland strawberry here, uh, plantain leaf sedge, um, my woodland strawberry growing over here too. And here's that witch hazel that I just planted last year and it's coming back and doing great. So I have a Canada anemone in here somewhere back there. Wonderful. So that, that one's doing really well. I'm very happy with that one. Uh, over here, this guy is my alvar. I've got wild strawberry, I've got uh, cylindrical blazing star, hoary vervain, um, and, uh, and some various other guys in there, which are really good. Over here, this one is a, I call it my riverside container. So this is simulating um, that kind of um, sloped uh, face that you would get near, um, near a river or near a water feature. And so I've got some violets there, sweet grass, um, northern bed straw, and there's a blue vervain coming up in the middle, which will be beautiful a little later on, as well as a smooth aster back there. Um, and yeah, just various others. So each one of them, again, I have a boulder situation over here, kind of like a rock garden. And these are my lovely sort of experiments. Um, I would say about, 95% of these plants are native to Southern Ontario. And, uh, and all of these containers with the exception of this one here and this one here um, actually overwintered. And the really cool thing that I learned this year for the first time is you don't even need to do anything. I mean, we had a fairly mild winter this time, but I did not put a tarp over these. I didn't um, protect them in any way other than, as I mentioned, leaves, putting leaves down um, to, to give them a little layer of insulation, but they just came back all by themselves, um, which is pretty amazing, pretty fun to watch too in the spring. So I definitely encourage you all to get into it. So um, with that, I guess, why don't we transition over to a little bit of Q&A. Atena, do you see anything coming in for me? Yeah, we have a couple of um, questions here. So um, let's just go, go through them and um, for as um, much long as we have. Sure. Um, so, okay. Um, should we be cautious about what native plants to use? I imagine some areas native species can become aggressive and invasive. Mm, mm. Yeah, great question. Um, there are a few species that do get a little spready. So, for example, um, Canada goldenrod is one that showed up on my balcony one year and within just a few months it went from a little seedling to the huge plant and um, you know it was really cool to watch. I actually have some in a small container here. Um, it's a plant that doesn't play so well with others as it were. So plants like that you may just want to consider who you're planting them next to because you know, maybe a whole container full of Canada goldenrod sounds like fun to you, but if you have other plants that you want to thrive in the same container as a Canada goldenrod, it may not work out like that. Um, as far as plants spreading outside and, you know, growing elsewhere in your natural environment, not something that I'm really worried about, to be honest, compared with, um, you know, 
horticultural varieties from the grocery store, um, those I worry about a little bit getting out into the natural environment. But native plants, if they escape and start growing in the wild, that's called ecological restoration. That's a wonderful story. There's nothing wrong with that at all. That's actually a, a good thing. So um, not something to worry about from my perspective. Okay, great. Um, and then there's another one that's sort of related to this too. So will you uh, post a list of your uh, container names, for example, Alvar, and what plants you have together in them? Sure, I would say, um, okay, two things. First of all, NAMPS has a great resource on this that was created by a number of um, NAMPS members that have grown native plants in containers, and that's available on the NAMPS website. And then the other thing that I would, I would just tell you to come by my social media, <laughs> um, botanical underscore Ryan, I'm always nerding out on my balcony. There's lots of pictures of my plants and their names and um, my learnings and progress throughout the year. That's probably the best way to, uh, to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I would say. Awesome. Um, the other one, so as butterflies, bees, etc., become used to having these plants here, are you worried about the impact when, when you move one day and this balcony garden disappears? <laughs> or are you just happy about the difference you made while you're here? That's a lovely question. I, I, I like that you're thinking about that. Um, for one thing, you'll notice that all of my, my containers have, um, do have, uh, handles on them and that's because I, I do plan to bring them with me <laughs> wherever I go but um, as far as and I do get bees up here is the other thing um, you may have noticed when I was on my camera mode my other camera that uh, I have linden trees out here so these trees I'm up at the sixth floor and I get a variety of bees usually from the months of June through to September October um, I get bees up on my balcony and they use my my uh, my containers as a little food source and habitat. Um, as far as when I move, are they? What are they going to do? You know, they're pretty resi They will find something, and hopefully by the time that happens, I'll have inspired some of my neighbors and some of my some other residents of my neighborhood to plant some native plant gardens too. Now, I don't want this to be the only garden of its kind. I hope that there will one day be lots and lots of gardens of this type, and so we'll be able to support many 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 pollinators and and wildlife and uh and it will persist for a long time so that's that's my hope <laughs> <laughs> okay so i i have a question on that actually from myself sure. um, and, and it's that how high up will the butterflies and bees come because like some of us live in higher floors some of us lower so if in case that's the question for for people as well yeah um, good question. So as I say, yeah, sixth floor here, no problem. I get them all the time. Uh, bees, butterflies, less so. I've seen during um, monarch migration period, I do see them fluttering by from time to time. But for the most part, butterflies stick a little bit lower down to the ground. Um, but we, so I've heard, I've heard people tell me now uh, when, they've, when they get bees on their balcony, and I've heard of people up to the 19th floor getting bees visiting them, which is kind of crazy <laughs> when you <laughs> ask me. So you never know. I mean, um, they'll surprise you. Basically, if you build it, they will come. Just, uh, you know, build that space for them. And even if no pollinators come, you are still supporting pollinators when you buy plants from local um, native plant nurseries. When you support NAMPS, you're helping pollinators as well. And by learning about native plants and by teaching your friends and your family, when you take pictures, when you, um, you know, have visitors over, when we're allowed to have visitors again, um, anytime that people are learning about their native plants and their local ecology, it's a good thing. You're, you're making the world a better place. So I, I encourage it, no matter how high up in the sky you are, <laughs> give it a try. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> uh, okay, so there are some questions around the container. So mm -hmm. um, their weight, um, is there drainage in the big pots? Good point. Yep, yep. So um, weight, I've never actually weighed the containers and it, it really does vary by um, by water. So when they're dry, they're considerably lighter than when they're all the way wet. So 
it's something that I, I early on, I figured that, um, cause there are, you know, you you should check your condo um, bylaws and figure out what the weight restrictions are on your balcony. Maybe not all of you will be able to get quite as, um, enthusiastic about gardening as I have, but I'm sure that one or two containers of this size um, certainly don't weigh as much as a, a balcony or a, um, a table and a, a barbecue and a propane tank. So you should be fine to do a few containers um, from the weight perspective. And um, in terms of the drainage perspective, absolutely, definitely encourage, um, there should be drainage for sure unless you're doing something like a wetland or a bog kind of container, um, which is possible, then it's good to keep that water all enclosed because you want it to be very moist and almost soggy all the time. But otherwise, for any other kind of um, habitat type, you want there to be drainage. And in my case, uh, because I'm doing the cloth, uh, the fabric material, that actually deals with drainage all by itself because the water sort of transpires, it sweats out the side of the containers. That seems to work really well for me, um, kind of moderating the moisture levels. So um, I really like that. The other thing that I do, oh yeah, I wanted to show this. So um, to, to remind myself when it's necessary to water is hopefully you can see this. I have these bamboo rods and I put them in all of my containers and these, this guy, you can see it's very wet. It's a dark color um, and there's soil sticking to it. That's because I just watered this container. So I put it in, I always put it back in a different spot and it's like a little um, dipstick basically. So if I pull that up and it's dry all the way through, then I know it's time to water. And I have one of those in each of my containers. It's super cheap. You can get a whole bag of bamboo rods for like, a couple bucks and uh, I do encourage everybody to try that so you won't have to be guessing about moisture. <laughs> nice yeah we've got some positive messages here as well so I've seen a few monarchs and bees on my plants mostly in late summer and fall I'm on a west facing 12th floor that's amazing. 12th floor <laughs> wow that is so cool I'm really glad to hear that um, yeah. more of that let's let's fill every balcony with um, with a few native plants, and maybe maybe we'll all get pollinators all the way up to the sky. <laughs> yeah. and we can we can just throw a small competition on pollinators. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. <laughs> Take pictures of those, by the way. Send them on social media. Let's uh, we can make a hashtag: uh, balcony native plants, something like that. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> okay, there's also another one, Ryan. Where do you think that pollinators go after they visit your native plants? Okay, great <laughs> question. Okay, so I want to share a little story quickly. Um, so of, of someone, I was doing a series of webinars earlier, and somebody in the comments said that they actually had some ground nesting bees that went into their containers. They actually nested in the containers and then they brought their containers in over the winter and the bees came out in like March and were buzzing around in their home. And they were asking, what am I supposed to do with these bees? Should I let them out or should I do what? And anyway, if that happens to you, that's amazing. It turns out you can actually catch the bees, put them in a little container and put them in the fridge and they will go back to sleep. And then and then you can leave them out or you can let them out in, uh, in May or late April when the temperature is warm enough for them. Fascinating. Anyway, that can happen, but I think for the most part when I get bees, they're just foraging. They're just here for a little meal, um, for a little bit of, uh, of nectar and pollen, and then they're, they're going back over to the linden trees, they're going back to the ground, and to their most of um, the bees species in southern Ontario, they actually nest in the ground and so it's a good idea, especially if you have sandy soil or, or rocky soil, to, to give those bees um, a little bit of space, a little bit of um, bare soil patches or rocky patches, and that's where they live. Um, those bee hotels are, are something too, but in talking to um, pollinator and bee experts, they really encourage people to leave some bare patches of soil in your garden. And that's where a lot of those bees are going to live. Awesome. Yeah. I did not know that. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's one specific, more specific question. Um, so 
Um, someone says, I have violets that become very invasive. Mm. How can I tame them? Okay, good, good question. Um, first of all, did you know that uh, native violets, like common blue violet, which I have over in my container uh, over here, my, my riverside container, I'll just flip over quickly. Um, so this guy right here is the common blue violet. Um, and that's actually a host plant for some lovely um, azure and skipper butterflies. So it's a really important part of our ecology. And if it happens to be spreading in your lawn, um, that's a good thing. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful thing. I think you should just keep them, hang on to them. Um, there's no need to, to pull those up. I've actually been encouraging other people to plant violets and strawberries in their lawn to sort of diversify things a little bit. So um, if it's an aesthetic thing, then maybe just consider thinking about that space from a different perspective, from the perspective of the wildlife and realize that they are, they appreciate the presence of those violets. So maybe, maybe this is not a bad situation at all and you've actually just saved yourself a lot of work and you can just leave the violets there. Um, now that's if it's the native violet. If it happens to be an English sweet violet, then, um, and you, you do wanna know the difference. So, so check out, um, I actually made an Instagram post about that a little while ago, so I can, uh, can help you figure out which one you have. Um, if it's the sweet violet, then you better start pulling <laughs> and keep pulling. <laughs> that's all you can really do. <laughs> awesome, perfect. So I guess we're almost at time. Mm -hmm. Unless there's anything else that you think um, you wanted to share with the audience. Um, just that, um, that gardening is a learning experience, you know, and um, I'm learning all the time. And it's, to me, it's, it's a trial and error kind of situation. I started off um, really not knowing anything about this. Um, I applied some of my ecological knowledge, which I've imparted to you today. I think you've got some great building blocks to get started on, but don't be discouraged if you find that something doesn't work out very well for you. Just try to document it and learn from it and then try again. And next year, you know, every year you can try some new experiments and you can learn a little bit more and share what you've learned with others. And together we can figure this out, all right? I think we could do it. So, so just give it a go. That's all I have to say to folks, just try. Perfect, thank you. So thank you so much, Ryan, for your wonderful presentation and balcony tour. I must myself learned a lot, so I'm sure it's, uh, it, it has been the same for everyone else as well. Thanks to each and every one of you who attended our webinar and made it a success. I'm happy to hear about any feedback you might have. And please don't forget to follow us on social media for more information on future webinars and events, hopefully in person sometime. And most importantly, stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.